Okay, I'd like to I'd like to welcome um, our participants uh, to to this uh, webinar on the global race for supremacy, uh, U.S.-China geopolitical tensions and implications for uh, the African continent. Uh, my name is um, Zukisi Gobo, um, the head of Fed School of of Governance. Uh, I will be. Um, moderating the session, but also giving uh, the opening remarks uh, to, to the discussions. Uh, we have um, two wonderful uh, speakers who, who have expertise uh, in, in this field, and I'm going to, uh, to introduce them. And, and then we, we will start uh, right away. Uh, we have uh, Ambassador uh, Michelle Gavin, who is a Senior Fellow for African Studies at uh, the Council on Foreign uh, relations. Uh, she has 20 years uh, of experience in international affairs um, uh, as well as uh, in, in, in not-for-profit uh, sector. Uh, she previously served as U.S. Ambassador to, to Botswana uh, and I think that was uh, betwe between 2011 and 2014 where when she also uh, doubled up as um, America's uh, representative to uh, to SADC. Uh, she also played a role as a special assistant to uh, President Barack Obama and, and was senior director for Africa at uh, the National Security Council. Uh, she also played uh, a key role in uh, the founding of, of YALI um, that was launched by President Barack Obama. Uh, the, if you want to, to read more about her work, uh, her resume will be on, on the chat line. Uh, Professor John uh, Stremlau is known to many of us in South Africa. She, he, had, um, uh, he has uh, spent some time uh, in South Africa at um, the advance um, back in the 90s. I think he left uh, at the end of 2005. Uh, and, and uh, he, um, uh, he, as a resident in South Africa, he was the professor, Jan Smart's professor and head of the International Relations Department and founded uh, the Center for Africa's International Relations at, uh, at, at VETS. Uh, from 2006 to 2015, uh, Prof. Stremlau uh, was uh, vice president for, for peace programs uh, at, at the Qatar Center uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, you will find more um, information on, on Prof. Stramlau at, um, uh, on, on the chat. Uh, we've placed the bio uh, on, on the chat. Uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to, to start off uh, with uh, the, a few remarks uh, that uh, the geopolitical tensions between uh, between the US and China dominated uh, global affairs, especially uh, during the Trump uh, administration. Uh, when the COVID-19 hit, uh, the two countries were, were still at each other's uh, throats. And I argue that uh, this is unlikely to, to change under Biden's administration. We, we are likely to see an acceleration, a, a deepening of, of these um, tensions. Uh, this is precisely because um, these are uh, very structural uh, tensions. They are largely about a global supremacy, and, and they do have implications for various regions of the world, including uh, the African uh, continent. While there might be some civility uh, in, in how the two leaders, Xi Jinping and Joe Biden, uh, relate with one another, and, and certainly how the two countries uh, interact with, with one another, I foresee uh, a very deep um, uh, uh, sort of deep uh, animosities uh, playing themselves out uh, behind, behind the scene. Uh, the, the US uh, regards China as a strategic competition uh, they, uh, under, under Joe, Joe Biden in the US in, during uh, the, the Trump administration, uh, um, Trump regard, uh, uh, framed China as a strategic uh, enemy. Um, now, the, these tensions, in my view, play themselves out along the four sources of structural power, um, the, which is security, production, finance, and, and knowledge. Unlike in the, 
in the Cold War era, the security component uh, is uh, typified uh, in cybersecurity uh, concerns uh, and uh, and and in in the in, in the in the risks uh, that uh, these uh, that cybersecurity poses uh, to both countries and and the U.S. has been uh, a country that has highlighted um, cyber uh, security uh, uh, threats from 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 China. The China's uh, weight has grown over the years. Um, there, there was a time when China and, and the U.S. Uh, had, um, or the relationship between the two uh, was, was marked by a great deal of, of respect. And, and uh, during the, uh, you know, I mean, from the, time, from the 1970s, uh, when Kissinger made uh, the initial trip to China, the two, the two countries uh, had been uh, growing uh, their, uh, their, their partnership um, gradually. Uh, to the time when they were characterized as uh, as the G2, uh, i.e. the pivot uh, for systems, global system uh, stability. Uh, during the global financial crisis, China grew in confidence uh, because they they see they saw the, the U.S. Uh, weakening in its confidence. Uh, they saw the U.S. power declining. Uh, America's competitiveness was was on the way and and the much vaunted uh, G2 uh, where, where where the US China interdependence was the end of global st stability began to uh, to weaken as I note uh, later the cracks uh, in my view uh, began during the Obama administration uh, for the Trump administration, China's flagship industrial policy, which emerged uh, after the global financial crisis, uh, the so-called Made in China 2025, became a target and, and the strategic posture uh, that, you know, that, that took shape under Xi Jinping uh, sought to shift, shift China, China's position away from dependence or interdependence on, on, on the US uh, and to chart uh, its own course along uh, 10 key sectors, um, information technology, robotics, aerospace equipment, ocean engineer, engineering equipment, high-end uh, rail transport equipment, energy savings, saving cars, among, among others. Internationally, China launched uh, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank and the Belt and Road Initiative, while also uh, accelerating its engagement with the African continent through the Forum for China and African Cooperation and Africa Cooperation. In my view, and undoubtedly, China is challenging the U.S. preeminence not only in the domains of production, trade, and finance areas, which it has already been building up a lead but also crucially um, in cutting edge scientific technology, especially in the realms of uh, artificial intelligence. And, and this is something that has um, rattled the US, especially during uh, the, the Trump administration. And we saw uh, a sweeping ban of um, uh, the Chinese tech companies, uh, especially those that were building up uh, AI assets. China is also carving out its international sphere of influence through cross-border infrastructure and development financing mechanism, uh, which it, it is using uh, to draw other countries into its orbit. Uh, you would remember that uh, during Obama's Obama administration, uh, Obama unsuccessfully persuaded uh, US allies in Asia and Europe not to sign up to the, um, to the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. And in my view, this showed the degree to which his administration was developing obsession with, if not uh, threatened by the rise of, of China. Now, quickly moving to, to Trump and, and the outlines of US-China tensions uh, during the Trump administration. Um, the, it, it was clear to me that um, the trade and tech race between US and China uh, has implications on had implications on the possible options for the African continent to navigate its economic development. Uh, the increasing use of technology as an instrument of geopolitics uh, could affect how other countries, especially 
in Africa manage their digital trans transformation, but also how uh, they navigate um, bilateral trade deals with great powers such as the US uh, and, and China. The tensions between the two countries escalated in particular in, 19, in 2018, when the US imposed uh, tariffs on several Chinese tech imports. And, and this was after the Trump administration had undertaken the Section 301 investigation into uh, uh, trade practices by China, as well as, of course, industrial policy practices on the back of Made, made in China 2025. By 2020, that is last year before the pandemic, China had imposed, sorry, the US had imposed tariffs on about 550 billion US dollars worth of products, uh, worth, no, worth um, of value on, pro, on, on products from China with China retaliating with its own tariffs to the value of about 185 billion US dollars worth of goods. And, and this forced uh, the two countries to sign the first phase uh, of an agreement that would um, start to wind down the, the trade war. Uh, that agreement is really in the doldrums, uh, especially after Trump was kicked out of office uh, at, at the end of his uh, first term. And, and, and the provisions of this agreement were never going to fly in any case because they were very onerous on China, they required the Chinese authority, authorities to enforce intellectual property protection and outlaw pilfering of trade secrets. Uh, the, uh, the US insisted on, on the removal of conditions for technology transfer and, and pressed China to address uh, market, market access issues, including health and safety standards on agricultural products. Um, and, and pressed China to allow US credit rating agencies to operate uh, freely in, in the US. Um, and again, I think it's important to underline that um, the, the, the uh, number of implications um, that this tension has uh, for, bo for both global stability as well as uh, uh, various regions of the world, including, including Africa. Uh, and on global stability, the multilateral system depends on, uh, on major powers working together. And it depends on, on major powers uh, fostering uh, cooperation, uh, uh, sustaining interdependence and, and building confidence. When two major powers such as China and, and the US are at each other's throats, it makes other countries uh, lose confidence in system stability and, and, um, and an array of multilateral uh, institutions. Now, as I said, the, the, this tension didn't begin with, with, uh, with Trump. Um, contrary to popular uh, opinion, popular opinion uh, during the Bush administration, there was a, a great measure of respectability uh, between these two countries, and this was anchored on the strategic economic uh, dialogue, uh, which was um, which had you know a number of uh, pillars, uh, including uh, looking at intellectual property concerns, uh, especially those that were raised by U.S. cultural industry, trade issues, uh, Chinese exchange rates, environment, food food safety, uh, as well as uh, some of the requirements uh, for tech transfers. But but there was a light touch on, on those. Uh, but there was a clear agenda during that time uh, by the US uh, to use this strategic economic dialogue to socialize China into the liberal internationalist world order. And, and China was playing along. Uh, it, it was looking up to the US in some respects. And when the global financial crisis hit, um, the, the U.S., um, uh, you know, the, the aura that the U.S. carried uh, began to, to fizzle and, and China uh, started to shape its own Beijing consensus uh, as, as, as more stead steadier in the face of U.S. decline and the perceived failure of liberal market economics to hold now, 
during Obama time, the two administrations uh, continued, um, uh, you know, that is, there was that chemistry in Hu Jintao and uh, no longer there. And Hillary Clinton, uh, in current stance, uh, against foreign policy priorities towards Asia Pacific, which uh, China rightfully read as uh, an attempt to undermine uh, its sphere of, of influence. Uh, it was Obama who took China to the World Trade Organization for its subsidies um, to the auto sector. Uh, and, and Obama took a very hard stance on, on China, on, on trade. Uh, they, there was um, a uh, a sense of competition between this, these two countries emerging already, as I indicated. Uh, Obama dissuaded uh, uh, the US allies from participating in the Asia Infrastructure Investment uh, Bank. And in my view, uh, during this period, uh, Africa took a back banner. Uh, there was a neglect of Africa uh, in, in America's foreign uh, policy. And China had been consolidating its position uh, using the the forum, um, you know, the forum on China um, and and Africa cooperation for CAC. Uh, Obama started his term very tentatively because he was weighed, uh, you know, he was weighed by the domestic uh, challenges uh, that were an outflow of uh, the global financial crisis. There was a hope that Obama's ascendance would boost the projection of America's soft power and shift the terms of its relations with Africa for the better, i.e. to prioritize the African continent more. His rise was therefore greeted with euphoria in the African continent. Uh, however, his singular most important foreign state policy statement, I think, in the African continent was more symbolic than concrete. And, uh, and the, for, the, for the large part, the Obama administration played a, a catch up uh, with China, uh, which had a more systematic uh, engagement with the African continent. Uh, for its part, America had a very thin strategic themes on Africa and was obsessed with the idea of counterpoising uh, China. Apart from his strident criticism of corruption and abuse of human rights, uh, by autocratic regimes, uh, there was very little that was original in Obama's foreign policy. Um, he stressed many of the themes of his predecessors, uh, in particular George Bush and, and Bill Clinton. Uh, these themes included promoting trade and investment and supporting the health sector through America's global health strategy, as well as championing conflict resolution efforts through strong regional security architecture uh, spearheaded by Africans uh, themselves. Obama didn't want to America to be in, entangled in uh, African conflicts or be reduced into a donor role. Uh, in, his, uh, in his calculation, the supply of leadership uh, was the responsibility of Africans themselves, and he saw his role as that of a facilitator through the creation of the Young African Leadership uh, Initiative. Uh, he gave a speech in, 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 in Cape Town in 2001, where he outlined um, some of the pillars of his strategy, the renewal of AGOA, um, the promotion of opportunity and development, sparing economic growth, advancing peace and security, and strengthening democratic institutions. But these were not in any way um, very original. Now, the you know, the, so in my view, there was really very little that um, Obama left by way of, of legacy in, uh, in his foreign policy imprints on, on Africa, compared to, for an example, uh, President Bill Clinton or, or President uh, George um, Bush Jr. Following Obama's administration, uh, President Trump could not improve on the limited blank of his predecessor's foreign policy except negotiating uh, the free trade agreement with Kenya. And there's really very little to say on this because uh, this is still underway. And I argue that uh, under Biden's administration, there, is, uh, th there won't be much change in the relationship between uh, the US and, and China. Early this year, uh, Biden implored the European, uh, his U US European allies to work 
with the US in countering the rise of China in a speech he made at Munich. Um, just a, a couple of days ago, the US Senate, Senate has proposed uh, the Strategic Competi Competition Act of 2021 to sustain US global leadership in its strategic competition with China. And some of the proposed measures include giving more aid to Africa and Latin America, but with greater priority uh, to Indochina. Uh, and, and some of these um, entail supporting technology cooperation in ways that could lock African countries uh, to a uh, one-sided uh, uh, sort of tech um, uh, dimension uh, because there would be, in my view, uh, restrictions to how much African, the Af African countries could collaborate with, say, China um, on, 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 on certain tech areas that they are already working with, with the US on. I argue that uh, in, in, in light of these, uh, these uh, tensions or geopolitical tensions, African countries should be pragmatic in their relationship with either China or the US and approach foreign policy and economic engagements from the perspective of their own national interests. Further, African countries should diversify um, the development of their partnerships, trade re relationships and technology sources and seek greater value in, in these partnerships. Um, to conclude, uh, they, they need to take seriously the African continental free trade uh, area, use natural, natural resources as, as leverage in bargaining with external actors and negotiate bilateral deals as a block rather than on a country by country basis, given their limited weight. I will leave my, um, uh, my reflections there. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, Prof. Stramlau, you want to follow? Thanks very much, Professor Kobo. And I will put my video on for the time being, but uh, we may kill it because of connection problems. Thank you very, very much for the uh, introduction and for the explanation about your paper, which was a very uh, important uh, contribution, and I've read it with great interest. Uh, I would like um, my topic to focus on specifically your concluding recommendation, namely African agency in moderating and channeling the U.S.-China rivalry for Africa's to an Africa's advantage. That's it, the agency, African agency is going to be my core topic. And I'm going to unfortunately be a little discursive, but I will try my best to keep focused on that. If there is a race for global supremacy, the main leg of that race is not in Africa. That offers Africa with opportunities and with challenges. I was reminded of this just in the last week with the release of the U.S. Annual National Security Threat Assessment, which was presented to the Congress as is required under law each year. Averill Haynes, the National Intelligence Director, and Bill Burns, who runs the CIA, presented this 27-page paper summarizing the threat assessments facing the United States. And not surprisingly, China was the number one, along with second Russia, Iran third, and the North Koreans fourth. That took up 16 pages of the 27 pages. Africa was allocated three sentences on page 27, and no surprise there, it listed the regional conflicts, Ethiopia, uh, West African instability, uh, Somalia, uh, Sudan, but then it had as its last sentence, the uh, electoral violence and contentious elections, which are likely to occur in Africa over the next 12 months. And I, I will come back to election observation and monitoring because I think it's central to Africa's ability to mount a collective effort uh, around some core normative values. But um, that national threat assessment at least was a reminder that where the real conflict is, is the South China Sea. Uh, Taiwan has become a domestic issue of political importance for Xi Jinping and for Biden, where anti-China sentiment is a bipartisan 
uh, issue in the United States. There's hawks on both sides, Republican and Democrats, and his anti-authoritarian criticism of the, uh, of the Chinese has really rankled on, on the China side. Um, Xi and Biden, I should add, have both shown political and economic interest in Africa, personal interest. The Biden-Harris plan for the African diaspora was a reminder that the African diaspora, both uh, former slaves diaspora, but more importantly, the rapidly rising number of African immigrants are an important key constituency for Biden in what has been a very, very close election uh, in, uh, in 2020. Um, at the same time, uh, Blinken's, uh, Secretary of State Blinken's uh, recent round of calls to African foreign ministers, uh, he met with Nalandi Pandor on the margins of the uh, G7 recently, um, did raise this issue of concern that America has over China's uh, increasing role in Africa and influence in Africa the old shibboleths of the debt trap and the workers, Chinese workers, uh, apparently was raised in some of these conversations. Um, the last ambassador to South Africa, uh, uh, Ambassador Lin Zhontian, uh, has gone back to Beijing uh, as now head of the Chinese People's Friendship Association with foreign countries, which is a very, very prominent and important position for China's relations with foreign countries and Ambassador Lin was seen as a rising star in China and close to Xi Jinping, a so-called wolf warrior who won't suffer American condescension to China easily. Uh, so there's tensions everywhere. The COVID-19 US TRIPS waiver um, for, for, the WH, for the WTO was an important uh, indication that the US is uh, running behind China in its Sinopharma um, uh, vaccines, which have gone to 18 African countries already. And WHO's emergency approval of Sinopharm vaccine is a very positive sign that indeed the, uh, in the public health area, in the vaccine thing around COVID right now, um, both the US and China may be competing for vaccine di distribution to Africa's advantage. And Africa should be very aware of that. The African um, uh, attendance at the Senegal FOCAC meeting, this is the 20th anniversary of the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation, provides another a very important opportunity for Africa to engage China. I don't know what's gonna happen with Biden's summit of democracies and who in, from Africa will be uh, represented there, um, but it is important to note that I think the G approach to neo-Westphalianism in, in Africa, that is to say sovereign equality and not to worry about the internal affairs, or they say they don't, about um, uh, 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 African countries. They have a very good relationship with uh, South Africa, which has a fundamentally different political system than, than the Chinese have. But nevertheless, um, they managed to get along very well in that regard. But at the same time, African values as reflected in the African Union Charter and in the African, uh, the African Union Constitutive Act and the African uh, Charter for Democracy, Elections and Governance are, are clearly uh, pointing toward uh, a, a liberal political inclination and aspiration. Now, Africa is simply too ethnically and religiously and economically diverse with weak governments institutions and, 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 and social trust deficits to operate other than by consensus and in accordance with some sort of democratic norms framing their aspirations for national and regional integration. But that does not stop the cooperation that is possible for, um, for China and for Africa if moderated by African agency. China was a civilization nation, but after 1949 and the revolution that Mao's cultural revolution occurred, um, governments now depend for legitimacy, that is to say the Chinese government legitimacy and authority according to whether or not they're continuing to economic growth and performance 
And increasingly, this variant of pan-Chinese ethnic identity, which hence makes the control of Hong Kong, Taiwan, and suppression of the Muslim population, the Uyghurs, a matter of US uh, outspoken concern uh, without passing judgment one way or the other. These are the rubbing points in that relationship. But in Africa, I believe agency can moderate this rivalry. And let me at least offer a few local anecdotes to in, inform our thinking about possible uh, African agency. When I first came for the Carter Center to the Democratic Republic of Congo for the 06 election, the US ambassador for the uh, uh, for, for, for um, the United States told me he worked very closely with the Chinese ambassador because the Chinese ambassador was a real Africanist and represented the new generation of diplomats for China in Africa who take Africa very seriously. And since that time, when I did a more than a dozen observation missions for the Carter Center uh, in elections, I always managed to see if I could meet with the Chinese ambassador to talk about mutual interests between the United States and the Carter Center, which of course, Jimmy Carter normalized relations with China and the African agency. In Guinea, for example, where the Chinese have real interest in bauxite, uh, a military leader back 10 years ago was trying to transition to get support from foreign friends for an election. And in fact, the Chinese joined the Western group of nations and I even have pictures of the Chinese flag on the ballot boxes in Guinea election as an indication of their practical approach to working for a common concern about stabilizing and peacefully transitioning to whatever regime the Guinean people would wish. I thought that was very constructive. In Liberia, Linda Thomas Greenfield was the ambassador and when we were doing the elections there and she worked very closely with the Chinese ambassador and embassy. They used to have dinners together uh, for their staff uh, every other month. And the, 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 they, they led to a, a division of labor around hospitals, which the Chinese would build and the software, which the US would install to improve the healthcare conditions in Liberia. Another example, in Madagascar election, I saw a Chinese observer mission there because they too wanted a stability and, and, and peacefulness in Madagascar because they want to do business. And, the, and you can't do business if there's chaos. Um, when the Ebola vaccine, Ebola uh, pandemic uh, occurred in West Africa, um, there was tacit co cooperation between um, the Chinese and the Americans to try to deal with the Ebola crisis. And I think the vaccines that COVID-19 presents another opportunity right now, and that the AU CDC and the future of pandemics is a subject that I think the US, China, and Africa can work together on if they just uh, quietly move, perhaps from the bottom up, through quiet consultations on mutual interests. Both Xi and Biden have expressed they would cooperate when it suits their respective national interest, and Africa is certainly one of them. I saw this cooperation in Sudan when um, former ambassador to South Africa, uh, uh, Princeton Lyman, and ambassador Zhang, who also was a former ambassador to South Africa, worked together and tried to mediate the crisis in South Sudan with the North Sudan. Um, and, and they also worked with the Carter Center when the Carter Center was exploring informally whether you could have a win-win-win on practical issues between uh, China, Africa, and um, the United States. And the Chinese were insistent that if the Africans wanted an agenda, they would support that agenda and the Americans should come along with it. And that seemed to be fine for all parties. In piracy, they cooperated together. Off the, when when the, the Chinese established a, a military base in Djibouti, General Mattis, who was then head of the Defense Department, said he thought it was a constructive step and that the Americans could live with it. So again, practical illustration of a common interest in security. Climate change, the Green Climate Fund, both China and the US were initially major funders of that. Biden uh, 
Trump pulled out, but um, Biden's new Green Deal does offer some promise. I must say though, that this is a real issue for China because China is so coal dependent and Xi is so dependent on keeping this 6% growth rate that it may create a problem down the road on climate change, which is of concern to Africa as well. Uh, and anti-terrorism in Mo Mozambique and Sudan and the African Union peacekeeping forces, I think America and China have possible areas for quiet cooperation and consultation. The US-Africa initiatives uh, so far have enjoyed bipartisan support from both Republicans and Democrats in the Congress as, as, uh, as Zhu has mentioned in the, in the past uh, Clinton administration, which is Democratic and, and George W. Bush Republican. Programs like AGOA and PEPFAR and Power Africa and Feed the Future have all survived the Trump administration because of congressional support. And Trump himself even claims Prosper Africa, which, which Sue didn't mention, but that the Development Assistance Corporation now has $60 billion to help finance US investment in Africa. Now, I know that some of the supporters of that um, program uh, were, were, were anti-Chinese hawks and saw this as a countering the Chinese, but now that you're, you're into a, a different era, if Africans speak up and link this uh, kind of uh, 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 assistance to the vision of the African continental free trade area, surely there is mutual interest on the part of the United States and China to be part of that for the sake of African development, peace and security, and not making Africa an issue for contestation between China and the US when they've got so many other problems, notably that Zhu has already mentioned, but certainly uh, geostrategically in the South China Sea. Who will lead the African agency is the next the agency that is, is the next question I have. Thabo Mbeki, of course, was very, very active in promoting African agency when he was president of South Africa, and he did so with his two amigos, uh, President Obusanjo from Nigeria and Buda Flika from uh, uh, Algeria. Uh, and it was in response to the G7 asking, what does Africa want? And, and Becky knew that there was a need for answers and that motivated that, that agency effort, which I thought was very promising until Thabo and Becky ran into problems on the domestic front here. Now, Nigeria would be a potential leader for um, for Africa in, 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 in promoting African agency. But last week it offered to host the AFRICOM military command, uh, which is based in Germany, uh, that had been turned down for 12 years by African countries who didn't want the American military presence increased on this continent. And now Nigeria is, is, uh, is, is going along. So I think that um, it's really for South Africa, which hosted the last OPAC that was in Africa, uh, and has re excellent relations with both China and the US to, to, to take the lead on this. But the ANC has, um, uh, and the ANC has had extraordinary experience lobbying in the US, knows domestic politics well, at least the older stalwarts of the ANC. Um, and there's very good residual will for uh, South Africa in the US, despite the problems that have afflicted the country since the state capture era of the, of the Zoom administration. So um, South Africa is at the moment, of course, seized with uh, a domestic crisis of its own. Cyril Ramaphosa's agenda, COVID-19, economy, climate, racial inequality and its legacy, gender violence, is the same uh, agenda that, that Joe Biden has right now in his domestic problem. And, 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 and Cyril Ramaphosa, like Biden, must contend with threats to democracy rendered by their populist predecessors, which still are in, 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 in inflicted on the democratic consolidation that must be renewed in both countries. And that is a total preoccupation for Biden right now. And it's a near total preoccupation for, for, um, for Cyril Ramaphosa right now. The rule of law, democratic rules of transparency and accountability were challenged seriously by both Trump and Zuma and both of those these democracies need to be renewed as a, as a domestic priority, along with COVID and the economic uh, crisis that conflicts them very differently crisis because America is a lot more of an economic power than South Africa, 
but there is generic uh, similarities that I think both uh, countries need to explore together, but also in consultation in the ways I've suggested with China. Um, uh, both Biden and, and uh, Cyril Ramaphosa won very narrow victories for the presidency in the case of Cyril Ramaphosa of the ANC um, in, in Nazarick, 179 votes. Uh, in the case of, 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 of Biden uh, in the Electoral College, not the popular vote, but the Electoral College, if 42,000 votes out of the 160 million had gone the other way, we'd have a second Trump administration. And this needs to be kept in mind with the 2022 congressional election looming that could return the House of Representatives to the um, uh, Republicans and increase their control over the Senate. Um, the 21 elections here are another bellwether for Cyril Ramaphosa's authority domestically here in South Africa. So any studies of African agency in the US-China rivalry must factor in Biden's extreme vulnerability to a state capture win by the GOP minority running largely on a campaign to um, exploit white racial fears and resentments about their declining status in America. China's approach also complicates African agency um, as, its, as its neo westphalian claims of neutrality toward internal affairs runs counter to the aspirations of advancing African integration nationally and regionally and continentally. So what are the next steps? Because I'll be very brief. The School of Governance could map opportunities and challenges for African agency locally at the national level, regionally for the eight RECs, regional economic communities, and at the Pan-African level. That's a tall order, I realize, but there are other interested agents uh, that could be uh, consulted and, and engaged in non-governmental organizations, businesses, and Becky's uh, high-level panel of the, under the ECA and the AU on illicit financial flows, which are vital for revenue to advance economic growth and agency for African countries. Um, the ARUA, the African Research Universities Alliance is headquartered at WITS. The research agenda on African agency could be more central to their work. At the African National Congress, in advance of this seminar, I decided to ask our branch, we, our, our, our local branch for Ward 87, uh, had a webinar on ANC renewal. So I said, uh, does the ANC yet have a position on the US-China rivalry and its implications for Africa and South African agency? And the answer from a senior official um, was, we are not yet clear on what our attitude is toward this. It'll take some time, not surprisingly, uh, given their other preoccupations. So there's an opportunity here, I think, for a voice from the School of Governance to resonate. And bear in mind that FOCAC is coming later this year, the, the, the forum for uh, China-Africa cooperation and its agenda, industrial production, infrastructure connectivity, training facilitation, green development, capacity building, healthcare, people to people exchanges, peace and security, all have relevance to the win-win-win that I've been speaking of, although industrial production, green development, health and, um, uh, and, 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 and peace and security may be the four areas of most promise for a substantive agency to advance. I will stop there and I hope that uh, this contributes in some way to my enthusiastic receipt of uh, Professor Kobo's uh, a paper, very good paper and his call for greater African agency in the US-China-Africa relationship. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Prof. Stramlau. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that uh, you still attend your ANC branch meetings. Uh, <laughs> just, just pulling your leg there. Um, uh, Ambassador Kevin? Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to join you uh, today, Professor Kobo and, and Vitz. I'm uh, really fascinated uh, by your paper, by the conversation thus far, and I'm struck by how many points of convergence there are uh, between what uh, you outlined um, and what Professor Stremlo just walked us through um, and some of my own thoughts. Uh, I actually have a paper being published this week about major power rivalry uh, on the continent and its uh, 
it's deeply comforting and encouraging to uh, to hear that um, uh, we do agree on a number of things. You know, uh, in terms of what we just heard, I, I do think you know there are some really important themes around the consistency uh, in U.S. policy that's sometimes a bit surprising because we do have these wild swings with our election cycles um, in tenor and tone, but this underlying uh, bipartisan consensus that's existed in the US Congress for a long time around Africa policy uh, has managed to uh, keep us you know, from veering wildly in practice. So there's the tone, which veered wildly certainly during the Trump administration. The practice less so, the Trump administration may have asked for extreme budget cuts and they did in our foreign assistance budget uh, but Congress uh, restored funding consistently year after year. I would also uh, say that you know the question of agency really is one that's um, preoccupied me because look, the competition for influence is an undeniable geopolitical reality. Uh, but I don't think that it needs to be from the perspective of a US policymaker the frame through which we understand our policy in Africa. So, you know, every major power is dealing with the same set of, of facts when they look really broadly and strategically at the African continent, right, around um, the incredibly youthful and growing labor force, uh, you know, which will be the, the largest labor force in, in the world by 2050, standing in, in really stark contrast to other aging regions. Um, so this incredible human capital, certainly, yes, natural resources, including uh, the, the rare earth uh, minerals that uh, Professor Kobo uh, talks about in his paper, which are going to be essential to humanity's tech-driven future. Um, and hopefully, increasingly assertive agency, uh, right? There's so much promise and, and peril uh, in Africa's demographic transformation, and the, the potential power of Africa's voice and vote in multilateral fora, uh, when the region's countries are united, um, could give it uh, influence it is not yet exercised on the global stage. Uh, and so that's gonna be important to any major power to understand where that's going, to see where there might be points of uh, convergence and cooperation. So I think that you know, with, with a host of interests at stake from the US perspective, be they related to security, economics, but I think most importantly, kind of the, the broad structure of global governance, the norms and rules that are gonna guide international relations going forward. The idea of approaching policy with your, your primary objective being boxing out rivals is not going to deliver any kind of real success or real influence. Um, I think that the most important thing for the Biden administration is going to be understanding that African states are not looking for one patron, one protector, one partner. They're looking for a broad range of potential partners uh, to choose the best offer in any given situation, right? To achieve the security and prosperity that they seek. And so, you know, the kind of finger wagging uh, rhetoric really needs to be uh, put on the shelf and consigned to history. There's very little to be gained by uh, complaining about African partnerships uh, with China. What the US should be focused on is how to make our partnerships um, more successful and more meaningful. Uh, so we need to break that habit, right, of warning about uh, potential pitfalls. But I, I do want to be clear, that's not a, a race to the bottom proposal, right? The, <laughs> there are certain things the United States uh, criticizes that I don't think uh, we should be in the business of doing, right? You, we're not going to uh, sell arms to uh, abusive governments just because if we don't, someone else will. We're not gonna sell surveillance technology to allow governments to repress their own people uh, simply because if we don't, someone else will. Uh, but we have to recognize that states seeking financial support to build critical infrastructure or satisfy their population's energy needs are pursuing legitimate national interests and abstract appeals to shared values or vague warnings 
about nefarious intent, right, are really very much beside the point. So we've got to be guided by a far-sighted understanding of our goals related to peace and security, prosperity and development, institutions and norms, and uh, and recognize that we benefit when African states are able to provide for their own security and address transnational threats emanating from within their borders, when African economic growth provides opportunity to African citizens and to those abroad who trade and invest and co-create with them, we benefit when Africa is a rule governed re region that bolsters respect for universal rights and the rule of law, when the principles enshrined in the AU charter um, and in other important uh, African regimes uh, are elevated uh, as policy priorities. Uh, so I do think that there are going to be, you know, in this effort not to, to make everything about great power competition, there are going to be consistent areas of tension between the US and China on the continent. And these will, will largely fall kind of into the categories of human rights and governance concerns, um, competition for uh, partnership and votes in multilateral fora, sometimes relating to that, that first topic, right? Uh, and uh, competition for resources. And then this question of technology standards, which does come up again and again. Right, the, the US campaign to dissuade governments around the world from relying on Chinese telecommunications behemoth Huawei has largely run aground. Uh, Huawei has years of market dominance on the continent and very generous, in, generous financing deals uh, made to engender loyalty and to lock markets into uh, their standards and products. And in the absence of a competitive alternative from a price point of view, uh, this is something that the US is likely uh, going to have to live with going forward. Now, there are some you know, more for, far-sighted kind of strategic proposals around US uh, innovation that's gonna require uh, more money for research and development so that um, an, in a future generation of technology, we might have something more compelling to offer that also comes at a price point uh, that has appeal. But these areas of tension certainly don't need to spark some kind of outright conflict or some uh, you know, return to, to Cold War uh, types of uh, engagements where the enemy of my enemy is my friend and we lose all sight of our actual uh, agenda with regard to the kinds of partnerships we seek on the continent. Um, and there are, as Professor Stremla points out, important potential areas of cooperation. Um, in addition to the ones that he highlighted, you know, peacekeeping reform is, is, is a significant one, right? Uh, as the top two UN peacekeeping budget donors, the US and China uh, both have an interest in making UN peacekeeping missions more effective and efficient. And the truth is that, you know, consistently half or more of, US, of UN peacekeeping happens on the African continent. So there's, there's an area where we could work together. Debt relief, as, uh, as controversial and um, loaded as the rhetoric is around the nature of Chinese financing, there is an inescapable reality that the continent is not going to recover from the global economic downturn created by the COVID pandemic without creating some fiscal space for governments uh, to operate. It's going to require debt relief, there are these early steps through the G20 and elsewhere to try and address this issue, but, but more is absolutely going to have to be done. So there are these you know, potential areas of cooperation, there are sources of conflict, but really uh, you know, aware of geopolitical competition for influence. You know, I think what the Biden administration needs to do is really focus on the fact that we're more secure and more prosperous when Africa is too, um, and pursue our interests, you know, in a in a way that uh, anticipates assertive African partners seeking the most advantageous security, trade, and investment development development arrangements they can get. Um, so the U.S. should be showcasing uh, what we have to offer. We should be uh, shoring up 
our own uh, model of governance, right, by addressing corruption in our own system, uh, forthrightly and honestly, modeling effective governments requ requires it, right? Uh, and in keeping with the Biden administration's overall commitment to reverse democratic backsliding and pervasive corruption, really reinvigorate the US commitment to the rule of law and transparency in Africa um, by working with partners to see uh, how we can help uh, as they work to strengthen the capacity to address these issues domestically. Really important here to acknowledge that combating corruption right, it's, it's a shared priority. It's not an Africa specific project. We are engaged in this project in our own society. And so an approach that is uh, open to learning from one another as we all uh, try and get our arms around this, I think will make the US a more desirable partner. Uh, and I think that, you know, part of uh, acknowledging that democracy, the strength of our democracy, that issues of corruption are domestic areas of concern, as well as international areas of concern, we need to be candid about our own struggles, including our struggles with systemic racism, uh, which, you know, we realize has certainly not been lost on international observers. Uh, and we've got to make concrete progress in addressing this. So no one, I think, uh, with any sense would argue that the US should pretend that our society embodies all of our professed ideals. We don't, we fall short, um, but we do now have an administration that's committed to trying to work on these issues and Americans uh, all across the country at municipal levels and above are, are trying uh, to get it right. So I think, you know, again, when we reach out and uh, argue that shared governance norms, respect for basic rights, are an important part of the kind of global system we wish to see, we have to recognize that our domestic and international agendas, they align and that the struggle uh, it has to be waged on both fronts. Uh, so a little bit of humility and candor, I think uh, are important, but I would uh, never argue that the US should abandon uh, that important agenda in its foreign policy um, simply because we do fall short domestically. Uh, and then the last thing I just want to flag is that I think the Biden administration has got some really important work to do uh, to kind of re-examine the way the U.S. thinks about stability. So it's, it's sort of a, a taken as a given that stability is at the top of our kind of broad strategic uh, set of priorities on the continent. Certainly justice does not thrive in an unstable situation. Prosperity does not come in an unstable situation except sometimes for the very few. Uh, but the way we have thought about stability, particularly since uh, the attacks of September 11th, 2001 has uh, too often been through a, a highly militarized lens, um, has too often depended on one authoritarian leader and taken that governance agenda and, and sort of uh, set it aside. And what we've seen is this fails time and time again, um, that the kind of bargain we enter into sometimes uh, believing that we're getting stability and the price we pay is giving up on some of these other important normative parts of the agenda. It's a bad deal. Uh, eventually uh, conditions change and we still have paid all the prices, but we don't have the stability. So I do think in looking at things like the US relationship uh, with Chad, with Uganda, there's gonna have to be a, a reassessment. And in looking overall at the failure of US policy uh, to bring greater stability to the Sahel, where the trend lines uh, have gone in a negative direction bes bes despite significant US investment, uh, all of this is gonna be requiring a rethink. And that actually is underway uh, in Washington. And then, you know, there's a big question about the international architecture uh, of, of multilateral governance and the US is going to have to make space for an assertive African presence uh, on the international scene. Uh, that, that means, you know, a rethink of the way Security Council seats are allotted. It, it means, uh, you know, grappling with whether or not the structure of international governance um, makes sense for this uh, 
young, dynamic uh, continent. So I'll stop there, uh, but I, I do think that um, there is a moment of tremendous possibility and potential right now to, to discard um, some unhelpful thinking uh, and to capitalize on the bipartisan consensus that does exist around engagement but we will always be constrained to some degree, right? Our own economy has been uh, badly uh, damaged by the global pandemic. There's also the reality that certain foreign assistance priorities, most notably uh, PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, the sheer amount of money the US spends on addressing HIV AIDS, this is, uh, you know, depending on how you calculate which accounts you look at, um, almost up to 80% of our foreign assistance. And we can't really pivot away from it once you've committed to helping getting people on life-saving drugs. You can't really announce you've changed your priorities and move on. So there are real constraints um, in the way uh, that some of this can find expression, certainly in a foreign assistance budget. But I would argue that um, there's also a great deal of space and opportunity. And the most important thing is gonna be having those African uh, voices uh, asserting their agenda um, to respond to and engage with. Uh, th uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Ambassador uh, uh, Gavin. Um, uh, just, uh, I hope my connection is good because I experienced connection. While you're still on the on the video, I'd like to um, just ask you a couple of questions. Um, the, I'll take some from the chat and, and then I'll go to Prof. Stremlau. There's a question on the chat I want to answer right away that we, why didn't, why we, why didn't we invite a Chinese uh, expert? Um, I, I, this was deliberate. It was my idea um, to have a conversation with, with the Americans precisely because the paper um, significantly deals with U.S.-Africa relations um, in, into the future. Uh, we certainly are going to invite um, Chinese um, uh, officials and, and speakers to reflect on China-Africa relations. I, I mean, if we had, if we were dealing with the two themes today, it would take um, half a day. Uh, so uh, there is a space for conversation, but the paper really is, is um, which I developed, is, is mainly focusing on on U.S. Africa, so it was my it was my idea. Uh, now, uh, Ambassador Gavin, I would like you to reflect on the you know the the um, um, the the question around the issue that you you highlighted um, on on the I mean one of the concerns that I I have and uh, looking at the Biden administration is its longevity. And the confidence that other countries may have uh, in whether the the blank that he has established would outlive uh, him, uh, and then also, I mean, from the uh, EU's perspective, can they trust America as a reliable partner? And Africa, also from Africa's perspective, can they trust America as a reliable partner? Uh, if Xi Jinping is contemplating change of heart uh, after what had what happened under uh, 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 Donald Trump, uh, can he really throw his eggs in in the American basket and and then have um, this disrupted when 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 Biden leaves and a Republican perhaps comes back and we back to uh, Trump, uh, Trump 2.0. Uh, so that's a question I would like you to 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 reflect on. And then uh, for Prof. Stramlau, if you could talk a little bit about the increasing use of human rights as a precondition for uh, deeper cooperation with with China and the prospects um, for the two countries to look beyond their their differences and work together on uh, on on vaccination of the world. Um, sharing vaccines beyond just the waiver, um, uh, sharing technology, opening their technology or, or transferring technology, know-how, skills, 
but also the uh, the vac vaccines uh, themselves. And and while you thinking about that, perhaps both of you, uh, especially Ambassador Gavin, given your experience in the African continent, how would uh, a, how would Africa's agency look like? Uh, there is a, a, a Prof. Stremla question from Gath Le Pierre um, that cites um, the that cites. Um, uh, 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 John Eikenberry uh, about um, the fact that China doesn't offer uh, a model of international order that, they, that, that the world can find co uh, um, persuasive, that is lack of soft power. Uh, and if this is so, uh, what is the future of the liberal uh, internationalist order and, um, and, and the future of current global politics? Are we stuck with the liberal internationalist order, or is there something that um, we we can env envisage uh, beyond that? Um, yeah, and then after that we will we will conclude because I see we kind of have eaten up the time. But yeah, over to you, uh, Ambassador Kevin. Sure. Um, well, I think you asked me one of the hardest questions, right? Which is how, why should anyone trust us when we just had. Um, such a, a outlier um, in terms of uh, you know four years of a U.S. administration that basically professed not to have interest in longstanding U.S. values. Um, can the U.S. be trusted? I sure hope so. Is the answer? I can't guarantee, right? And no one can um, that our politics uh, doesn't. Uh, sort of bubble up that kind of quasi-authoritarian populism. Again, we have some real structural challenges that we're trying to address here domestically uh, around voting rights, um, around representation, and there's a tremendous amount of work to be done. But I would, I would say that it is notable that even during those four years of the Trump administration, despite the you know, insulting and flippant remarks that may have been coming from the Oval Office, you did, and even with our divided uh, uh, governance in Congress, you did still have enough bipartisan consensus to keep the bottom from falling out of important uh, US partnerships on the region. Um, and so there is clearly a strain of something uh, stable and lasting. Uh, and I, I think that the more successful the Biden administration is, particularly in this early stage before our midterm elections, in um, getting some things done that can deliver for all of us, uh, the greater the chances um, that we can uh, leave this uh, experiment in abandoning our values behind. Um, you also ask about, you know, what does African agency look like? I, I would just point to um, at the start of the pandemic, the really excellent job that uh, Africa did, um, both in terms of organizing itself uh, under uh, President Ramaphosa's AU uh, chairmanship uh, of, of sharing information, but then critically of communicating with the rest of the world about Africa's concerns and priorities, sending out high level envoys, uh, right? With a unified message about uh, how Africa could not be left behind in the response and the importance of addressing that economic dimension and the, the fiscal space. There were concrete proposals that Vera Songwe, right? Was coming up with about um, how the international community um, might be able to help create the fiscal space necessary to, to prevent uh, catastrophe uh, on the continent in terms of, of economic devastation. So there was, uh, I think, a, actually a really great example of, of not just um, don't do this, right, or not just resistance to a, a, a worrisome direction that uh, others appear to be going in, but very concrete ideas, proposals, and, and messaging, and all of it being consistent with uh, the professed principles and priorities of, of the AU uh, itself. So 
you know, I, I would just flag that maybe as, as something we could look to as an example of, of how agency might be made manifest in the international system. Sure, great, thanks. I didn't try to summarize the presentations. I think they were, they were incredibly insightful uh, for, from both uh, yourself, uh, uh, Ambassador Kevin and, and, uh, and Prof Stramla. I just wanted, wanted to acknowledge that uh, very comprehensive, but uh, insightful um, um, uh, present, presentations. Um, over to you, uh, uh, Prof Stramla. Um, I've got a couple of tall orders here, and I'm not sure I, I, I'm going to get the questions right, but let me start with the second one on liberal international order and its future, and, uh, and then segue back to uh, your questions, uh, Professor Kobo, on uh, vaccine diplomacy and, and, uh, and human rights. Um, on the future of the international liberal order, it's up for grabs right now, and it's up for grabs in large measure because America's commitment to that order is up for grabs. I am not sanguine about Biden's capacity to keep control of the executive branch after 2024, and I'm not sanguine about the Democrats maintaining their very thin margins in the, um, in the, in the, in the Congress. And what you have to remember is that the American uh, constitutional system suffers from severe def democratic deficits. Uh, we, we as a country tolerated a criminal behavior of slavery that was enshrined, but also author electoral authoritarian regimes in the Southern states, which got seniority and control. So when um, the support for apartheid was couched as an anti-communist, anti-Cold War um, uh, instrument, it was also advancing the kith and kin between Southern segregationists who controlled the chairmanships of a lot of the committees in the Democratic Party in, that, in those days, and, and, um, and, and uh, the alliance with the apartheid government. Um, there, there has to be a coming together in America over its shared history, and that's very, very difficult. And at the moment, <clears throat> there is sufficient polarization, which is unlike apparently anything since the Civil War, I don't remember that, but certainly anything in my lifetime, and I've been around since Harry Truman was president, um, who belongs to America is of issue. The big lie that the question is, did, did Biden uh, really win the election? Well, the Republicans are saying, no, it was stolen. Who stolen by whom? Well, they, they, they say it was the African-American bloc that supported, but the American, African-American bloc supported Hillary Clinton by the same levels. It's extremely important for Biden's election, all of the ethnics uh, that supported him, all of the sub-identities that supported him were, were important, including um, uh, uh, li those living abroad, like in the Democrats for Abroad in South Africa all turned out for, for, for Biden, but at the same time, uh, what really happened in the 2020 election, according to uh, Biden's own pollsters, was that the whites, liberals, and, and elderly were so furious at his mishandling of COVID that Biden was really saved by the COVID pandemic. I, I, the COVID pandemic killed a half a million Americans uh, because of Trump's mishandling of it. And, and so I can never say there's a silver lining to, the, uh, to, the, to that, to that the, the terrible disease. But it certainly did allow Joe Biden to win by a very narrow majority in the Electoral College. Um, 42,000 votes out of 160 million, as I said, could have changed the outcome just to 78,000 in 2016. One of the agenda items between the US and South Africa should be electoral reform, but that's a whole other subject. Um, but the liberal order um, is, is at risk because the liberal commitments of the United States, flawed as they are, are, are at risk. And, and I don't think that absent uh, a counterpoint to the China author, authoritarian alternative, um, at that general level, we, we, we have much, much, much prospect because I don't think China's either, China is not a hegemonic power. It has no imperial designs on Africa. It wants to do business because it wants to sustain its economic growth and it wants to reunite with the other uh, Chinese speaking um, uh, elements, notably Taiwan, 
and that is, is a red line for, for the Biden administration, and that scares me. Anyway, on the increasing um, view of, of human rights, uh, this, this is, is, is something that's going to be tempered by Biden's and, and his administration's commitment to multilateralism, its commitment to humility, its commitment to reestablishing America's democratic credibility. So at the moment, while he articulates this view, they don't push it very hard until, and rightly so, they restore America's credibility on that front by coming to terms with the legacy of crimes against humanity, which are uh, embedded deeply in the, in the bloodstream of American life because of the treatment of African Americans, um, you know, 12 generations of slaves before the Civil War and then several generations afterwards until the civil rights legislation in the, in the 1960s, and then, and then a couple of generations more before you have Black Lives Matter and now. It is a inflection point in American history. And I think the more that Africans understand that, the better off they will be in responding to and encouraging the better angels of America's nature, to quote Abraham Lincoln. On vaccine di di diplomacy, um, it's, it's vaccine politics. And I, I just want to commend um, uh, Tedros for welcoming, on the one hand, the US waivers, which were done in part by a realization. I mean, in part, there was a moral imperative to do it, in part because Biden has finally um, vaccinated his, his domestic audience, which is politics, the local politics required, that he can turn to um, getting some of this surplus uh, out there, but also helping um, develop local vaccine capacity um, because the Chinese were already sending Sinopharm uh, to 80 countries, uh, 20 of them in Africa. And, and uh, that, that diplomacy was, was working fairly well. I mean, I think the Russian diplomacy, vaccine diplomacy is, is a lot of noise, but not much actual vaccines, but the Chinese have, have done 80 countries and, 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 uh, and, and either donations or selling uh, and Sinopharm, um, farm, Sinopharm and, and, uh, is, is, is uh, apparently fairly efficacious and, and good. But the, but, the, but the big pharma, of course, is countering that by questioning it, but also science. And this is the last point, that the transparency of the US about scientific evidence, which is certainly adhered to by Cyril Ramaphosa here with the councils and, 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 uh, and, and the expertise at public health, frankly, outgrowth of the HIV campaign that has served us very, very well here during this pandemic for all of the uncertainties, for all of the difficulties, for all the logistical problems. Um, if, if this, if, if Biden and, and, and Ramaphosa have two things and have many things in common, one of them is they've got to vaccinate their people. And I, I, I commend South Africa for the efforts that are underway. And I still have my fingers crossed that we will get a rollout that will work. I know that uh, Professor Kobo is rightly skeptical of some of the uh, a rollout possibilities as we all uh, have to be given the difficulties of getting this to particularly to the rural areas. But I, I am confident that, that, that Cyril Ramaphosa understands it's absolutely vital to his domestic political support to get his people vaccinated. Uh, I guess I better end on that. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Ramlau. Um, uh, as I said, we are our harshest critique, so it's always great to see um, uh, sort of a an outsider's view on on how we're doing so that's actually very it's it's encouraging it's encouraging um because i think the hope is really at at, at a low uh, sort of ebb in south africa currently uh perhaps um uh, questions for you to conclude with uh to both of of, of you um and you know the the first is um really question from the audience which is um, is health investment another form of development aid? Uh, that is from Ashraf Patel. And, and then the questions I would like for you to conclude with is um, just the rise of um, domestic uh, fixation with a domestic environment, not just in the US, but also in, in, in the UK um, and in China and, and elsewhere. Uh, the the rise of uh, industrial policies um, and uh, and and this sense that uh, we need to 
focus more at home on the home front um, while the world is increasingly becoming fractured. Um, how do we extricate, how do countries extricate themselves uh, from this uh, national, you know, uh, uh, this obsession with national politics and the welfare of um, the domestic constituency constituencies, and and the second question is um, related to obsession with China, obsession of the of the U.S. political um, uh, system currently with with China. Um, what are some of the? Uh, isn't this a liability uh, for? Uh, you know, for for the U.S. Um, and 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 that it forecloses um, the possibilities to think uh, more innovatively and creatively about how it can work with partners that it may not agree with on human rights issues to stabilize um, the world, especially in 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 times of crisis. And perhaps finally, um, what how do you see the, the Europe's um, the European Union's positioning? In all of these, uh, there is a sense that um, it wants to carve out a space as a champion of mul multilateralism, as a norm, a normative uh, a leader of, uh, of of new norms uh, around technology, um, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, uh, as 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 well as um, to to reclaim its its place uh, to you know to promote multilateral co cooperation. Where do you see the U.S. Uh, in in this in this reconfiguration and um, and therefore how uh, should Africa uh, play uh, play its game uh, and then we'll conclude I will not make any concluding remarks I will at the end thank the participants uh, perhaps you want to start uh, Professor Stramlau um, these are very big and complicated questions so maybe uh, I can defer to um, Ambassador Gavin on, on, on some, some of them. Uh, I would just like to take the one on uh, the domestic environment predominating and just point out as we joked before this uh, uh, webinar began uh, that I'm more uh, attuned to the school of governance perhaps than I am to my trained field of international relations these days. And in part, I owe um, my, my understanding of the importance of what happens within states to the African Union's um, fundamental shift from the organization of African states, which, which was very Westphalian and recognized sovereignty quality above anything else. Now, the internal affairs of member states is not a subject of indifference. The principle of non-indifference is, is, is alive, but it's, it's under stress because of uh, the, 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 the turnaround of rising illiberalism that Freedom House has documented over the last 15 years has applied to Africa too. And I don't think we can be neutral about the internal affairs of member states, particularly if today's human rights abusers are tomorrow's refugees in fragile Africa. It becomes a collective responsibility. So how do you do it? How do you get regional organizations, the, the, the eight RECs and the African Union to put pressure on um, the right side of the scale for stability, and that usually means accountable and transparent governance inside member states. I, I think the African uh, international relations is one of the most creative and innovative uh, going in the world, and it's not really appreciated outside, but that's just my personal uh, parochial uh, interests uh, prevailing there. Um, but uh, it, it really is the case that uh, Africa cannot be neutral about the American, American domestic politics. They're not neutral on Black Lives Matter. And they shouldn't be neutral on the difference between Biden and Donald Trump, um, who is a blatant racist and a liar and uh, a cheat, as his lawyer um, uh, famously told the Congress uh, when he turned on, on Trump. And there are too many people in the Republican Party who are interested only in capturing the state by, uh, by perpetuating that minority um, regime through the rural um, overweighting of voting and through the um, effort to, to, to appeal to white ethnic nationalism. It's amazing that America is turning tribal at the very moment that Africa is turning civic. Um, and China, frankly, is somewhere in between because the, the Cultural Revolution did destroy a lot of the old ethnic ties and identities, but it certainly is creating now under Xi Jinping 
a Chinese, a pan-Chinese identity, ethnic identity, which is not diverse and is not inclusive and is not as complex as what afflicts, um, what, what faces Africa, not afflicts, but what faces Africa as a challenge for tomorrow. So domestic politics really have to be seen as the foundation for constructive international um, consensus building and, uh, and, and integration. Uh, and, and, and integration at the regional and, and continental level has to be according to the democratic transparency rule of law uh, uh, in some extent. And that's a long time uh, uh, objective, but agenda 2023 is, is also includes those references to those values and norms as well. So I maybe you should stop on that and defer to um, uh, Ambassador Gavin to take the other questions about uh, um, uh, the European Union and the, and the uh, a partners to for stability. Okay, well, uh, I'll do the best I can. This feels like the speed round and they're, they're big and important questions. They're excellent questions. L let me make sure I address this question about um, health and, and uh, international uh, sort of uh, health related programs. So the US, you know, in a fiscal year spends over $5 billion in Africa alone on health priorities. Um, is this development? It's yes, uh, there's you know, a huge health, sorry, health systems strengthening, which is a hard thing to say fast, component um, to our uh, work uh, that, that even, that it, the work that's characterized as disease specific. So even HIV AIDS or malaria work has this, health systems component that's that's designed to help, you know, build lasting capacity in uh, national health systems to, to address any number of issues. Um, you know, the idea that it's uh, some kind of self-serving SOP to pharmaceutical industries, I really don't think is borne out by the evidence. And you can absolutely disagree. And our, our own national healthcare system is an unspeakable mess, right? Um, but if you kind of look at the record of US uh, health uh, spending on PEPFAR, on malaria, on TB, on non-communicable diseases, um, the, the gains are significant. There's some pretty rigorous um, measurements there. Uh, and you know the big idea is that healthier societies are more stable societies or more prosperous societies and certainly strong health systems um, make us all safer. This is, I think, top of mind for all of us after um, after these many months of coping with COVID-19. And so, uh, you know, on kind of these, uh, some of these other questions, at least, uh, you know, how not to become totally obsessed uh, with uh, competition with China. I, you know, I, I think that the Biden administration has been pretty clear about some of the really big challenges um, confronting the US that don't confront us alone and that we can't possibly address alone. Those include pandemic disease, includes you know, the existential threat of climate change. Uh, so you know, there's, no, there's no getting to solutions to these big problems uh, without working with China to some degree. There's also no getting to solutions without acknowledging African agency and engaging African priorities. Climate change is a great example, right? Uh, Africa suffers uh, from a problem it did very little to contribute to. And the solutions that we come up with must, absolutely must take account of the fact that Africa is energy starved and cannot be expected to continue starving itself uh, to try and address this problem. We have to simultaneously acknowledge Africa's uh, very real energy needs, um, while also trying to build a global coalition uh, that can save the planet. It, one won't work without the other. Um, and so I think that, you know, kind of framing uh, issues in, in a way that recognizes uh, solutions are multilateral can help us uh, get out of you know, a kind of bipolar um, and fundamentally unhelpful mindset. With regard to the EU, I think they play a very uh, important role, not least in uh, bolstering support, support for this idea of kind of institutionalized rule governed international relations, right? At the very heart of the European integration project. Um, 
And something that if you look, for example, at the dynamics in the Horn of Africa recently has really been at risk in Africa, um, where there's you know, uh, increasing engagement from Gulf states who prefer a much more transactional and kind of ad hoc model. Uh, I, I think that the, the EU uh, you know, both has a, a long history uh, of pursuing its own policy priorities, but, but also I think can be a force for and an important um, ally of uh, African institutions that uh, kind of seek to bolster this idea of, of agreed upon normative rule governed behavior uh, between states. So we all have a little bit more certainty right, and know what the rules of the road are. That's a good thing for everyone. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you so much, um, Ambassador Kevin. Um, I mean, these are not questions we can fully um, explore in, in an hour of a webinar, but um, they trigger more thoughts on the research agenda, especially for those who are doing scholarship. And, and certainly I'm thinking uh, about our own research uh, at at the school, uh, and and the, and the sort of thing sort of things our students could um, uh, could 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 grapple grapple with. So on that note, I would like to um, end the webinar uh, and once again to thank the two of you for taking time aside uh, to share your really incredibly um, great insights um, from a practitioner's uh, point of view, but also continue from people who are continually reading. Um, you know, the shifting global trends. Uh, so this is really, uh, I, fa I found it uh, really informative. Um, and also to thank our participants for staying with us uh, throughout the, the discussions. Hope we can call on you again in future. Uh, thank you ever so much uh, for, your, for your time. We'll close the, uh, the discussion now.